Hello, my name is Tyler Vanderweel. I'm the Loeb Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and also the Director of the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University. I will be speaking today on human flourishing and education. I will begin by describing the concept of human flourishing and also different approaches to attempt to measure or assess flourishing. I'll go on to describe various positive psychological interventions and activities that can be used to promote human flourishing and could do so within school or classroom settings. I'll speak about education itself as a pathway to flourishing and how this flourishing lens can help me clear the importance of education for well-being. I'll conclude with some discussion of various implications of this notion of flourishing and of the possibilities for promoting well-being in educational contexts. Uh, more information on some of the material I'll be presented today is available in these papers listed on the slides in the Proceedings of Academy of National Sciences um, and also in the Journal of Positive Psychology and Well-Being. Uh, you can find further information as well about the work of the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard at its website. So many of our academic disciplines aspire to grand visions of human flourishing. The World Health Organization uh, defines health in its 1948 definition, a definition still in place today, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Economics is sometimes conceived of as the study of how agents maximize their expected utility, supposedly taking into account all aspects of an agent's preferences. Now, the discipline of positive psychology is sometimes described as the scientific study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. But if we turn to our actual studies in these disciplines, we find that they're often restricted to very specific disease states or simple measures of positive affect or happiness or the study of income. They don't encompass flourishing in this broad sense. So what is flourishing? If we turn to our dictionaries, uh, we find the following. The Oxford English Dictionary flourishes to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way. Uh, or the American Heritage Dictionary to do or fare well. Uh, the etymology of the term comes from Latin florere to bloom, blossom, or flower. It's often used to translate uh, Aristotle's eudaimonia, uh, sometimes also translated as happiness. The working definition we've been using at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard is that Flourishing or complete human well-being is a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. Um, and this is arguably what we are after as individuals and should be after uh, as a community. But with a conception so broad, we might wonder how we might make any sort of progress at trying to measure or assess or improve flourishing. Um, the discipline that I think has come the closest to doing so is that of positive psychology, which has put forward a numerous measures of psychological well-being and conceptions of well-being. Um, but notice, noticeably absent from these measures of well-being are any notion of health. And are we truly healthy if we are not? Are we truly flourishing if we are not uh, physically healthy if we're bedridden, for example? Uh, missing from many of these assessments, as well as any sort of notion of, of character uh, or virtue, really contrary to, to Plato and Aristotle, really most of the Western philosophical tradition and, and philosophical, cultural, and religious traditions uh, worldwide. Uh, the recent emphasis on character education, likewise, points critically to this notion of character or virtue as being a critical part of flourishing. But again, with a conception so broad, how would we go about measuring flourishing? And surely conceptions of flourishing are going to differ across persons and cultures and philosophical and theological traditions. So can we really achieve any consensus in a pluralistic society uh, such as we live in if we are going to promote flourishing within education? Um, surely we need um, some sense of consensus to be able uh, to advance uh, this and, and if we have this broad notion, how do we do so? And what I would argue is that while conceptions of flourishing will indeed vary across um, cultural and religious and philosophical traditions, um, I think there are common elements. I think any reasonable conception of flourishing would include uh, the following five domains of human life. Not that flourishing is reducible uh, to these five domains, um, but that any reasonable conception of flourishing, while it might include more, would include these five as well. 
and these are happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. Again, I don't think these five exhaust our notion of flourishing, but they are arguably a part of it. I think each of these also satisfies the following two criteria. Each is nearly universally desired, and we have some empirical data up now on this as well. I mean, each constitutes its own end. It's sought for its own sake and not simply as a means uh, to some other ends. And I think these two criteria, being nearly universally desired and being an end in itself, uh, might help sh shape consensus on what uh, to measure and what to promote, even in pluralistic contexts. At the Human Flourishing Program, we have developed a, a brief index of uh, human flourishing, essentially taking two questions in each of these five flourishing domains, questions that uh, have principally been s selected from the existing well-being literature, questions that are uh, used with considerable frequency and that have received some degree of empirical validation. Uh, the only two Questions which were newly proposed were those on character and virtue, and although there's been tremendous advances with regard to the measurement of character in recent years, uh, there is relatively little in terms of global assessment. And so working with philosophers, we proposed um, two fairly global questions based on uh, the, the notion of the cardinal virtues, that at the foundation of all the moral virtues lie four, uh, practical wisdom, justice, uh, fortitude, or courage, and temperance, or, or moderation. And so the 10 questions that we've been using in our flourishing assessments uh, in educational settings and, and elsewhere um, as, as well are, are as follows. Uh, the first domain, happiness and life satisfaction. First, how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? And this is one of the most frequently used well-being questions used in, by the OECD and the UK's uh, annual survey, and in many other contexts as well. Uh, and then something more about feeling happy, the affective side. In general, how happy or unhappy do you usually feel? Uh, each of these scored 0 to 10, uh, not at all satisfied, 10 completely satisfied, for example. Uh, and the second domain is then physical and mental health. Uh, first question on physical health. In general, how would you rate your uh, physical health? A very commonly used question in various uh, surveys. And then secondly, how would you rate your overall mental health, taken from the World Health Organization's surveys? Uh, the third domain is meaning and purpose. Uh, the first question here, overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? And this, again, is one of the most widely used well-being questions. It's again, it's been used in the UK's annual survey um, by the OECD and, and others as well. Um, and then something more cognitive, uh, I understand my, my purpose in life. Uh, the fourth domain is uh, character and, and virtue. Uh, the first question intended in some very crude way to try to capture uh, practical wisdom and, and justice. I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging situations. And then a second question or item aimed at assessing in a crude manner uh, fortitude and, uh, and, and temperance or moderation. I'm always able to give up some happiness now for a greater happiness later. Then the fifth domain, uh, close social relationships. These were taken from the uh, UK's Campaign to End Loneliness survey of uh, various items and measures that have been used for, for uh, relationship satisfaction and, uh, and, and loneliness. Uh, first item, I am content with my friendships and relationships. Again, as the other one scored zero to 10, essentially trying to capture the, the quantity or extent of those relationships. And then secondly, uh, my relationships are as satisfying as I would like them to be, essentially trying to capture the quality of those relationships. Uh, in most of our work on, on flourishing and our assessments in school-based settings, uh, we've uh, looked at the scores in each of the individual uh, domains because, as I will indeed describe later, patterns can be very different across uh, these domains of flourishing. Uh, but one can also average all of, of the scores for an overall crude assessment of flourishing, but really this should be treated as nothing more than a composite of the five uh, more meaningful individual measures. Uh, we do supplement these 10 questions with two others, essentially trying to assess uh, financial and material uh, stability. Essentially, does an individual have the means to sustain uh, these other domains of flourishing over time? And the two questions we use in this final domain are first, 
How often do you worry about being able to meet normal monthly living expenses? Um, one of the most commonly uh, used uh, questions in the financial well-being literature. And then also, how often do you worry about safety, food, and housing? Um, and one could include this sixth domain as, as well, um, or average across all, all 12 questions for a more secure measure of flourishing, um, possibly less satisfactory conceptually, since the financial resources are arguably a means, not an end, um, but perhaps more satisfactory in practice in indicating flourishing uh, over time. Um, so this is what we've used in many of our uh, flourishing assessments and in workplace settings and community settings and medical uh, settings and in university settings. Uh, in, in school settings, uh, we do have an adolescent uh, version of uh, this measure with, with four items modified essentially to take into account um, the, the developmental stage of the participants. Uh, but otherwise, it works in a very similar manner. Uh, and I, I won't go into details here, but we have a number of papers showing uh, good psychometric properties of the index as well. Um, and when we've used this in, in different um, contexts, in addition, in addition to being useful for research purposes, I think it's been helpful for, uh, for individuals to understand um, and think about and reflect on their own lives. The questions themselves provide an opportunity for self-reflection. It can also be helpful for sort of identifying areas of, uh, that may be in need of improvement or, or changes one wishes to make in one's life to, to try to address and improve various aspects of flourishing. It can be helpful for tracking over time to see if, if one's flourishing in these different domains is going up or, or down and what one might do about it. So some of the feedback that, that we have had uh, in using uh, this uh, ass assessment in these different settings is as follows. Um, some questions made me stop and think, or it was pretty eye-opening to see the areas that I really need to work on. Again, opportunity for, for reflection, um, learning and, and discerning uh, what changes one wants to make in, in life. Another response, relief that someone is asking. I want help in, in certain areas. Again, the, the, the tracking and the documentation can help identify individuals for whom you know, additional outreach might be uh, important or alternatively slightly caught off guard with the questions around purpose or missing a greater purpose, need to reach out more and, and, and give back. Um, so, so again, the very nature of asking these questions can help people reflect upon their lives. Uh, and this sort of um, even descriptive work on how flourishing is um, changing over time can be useful in terms of understanding what's happening in school contexts in universities or, or in society more broadly, and I'll be coming back to these points a little bit later in, in this talk as well. Uh, but just as an example, we've collected data on these uh, flourishing measures in a roughly uh, nationally representative sample of, of the United States, uh, representative of the U.S. on um, geographic region, gender, um, race, ethnicity, uh, age, and, and also by weighting educational attainment and religious self-identification. And we've done this both in, in January of 2020, um, before the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also June, uh, in the midst of it. Um, and so un unsurprisingly, uh, flourishing as a whole has, um, has declined. But the patterns are very different across uh, the domains. Um, so you'll see the, the um, sample means um, in January and June in the two columns. And uh, for several of the domains, there's been a fairly substantial decline that, that has taken place in happiness and life satisfaction, about 0.7, nearly a point on that scale. And likewise with mental and physical health, pretty substantial uh, declines, financial and material stability, again, about a point, uh, the, the, the largest decline, which is indicative of the, um, the large levels of, of, of unemployment and, and employment insecurity that has resulted um, from this. But it's also interesting to note that um, some of the other domains seem noticeably less affected. Uh, slight declines, but not all that substantial with regard to meaning and purpose um, or, or character and, and virtue um, or, or even close social relationships. A, a slight decline, but not, not very uh, substantial. So we can see which aspects of well-being have changed more versus uh, less and which are perhaps in, most in need of being addressed. Um, importantly, also the the standard deviation of responses in all of these domains has gone up. So 
Um, so responses have been um, more va- are more, more variable now. So while social relationships domain has only gone down um, a, a little bit, the increased variance indicates that you know, for some, this in fact has been a time to invest in relationships or family or, 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 or housemates or to reconnect with distant um, relatives. And their social relationship scores have in fact gone up. But, but for others, well, this has been a very difficult time. They've perhaps been, been uh, socially isolated. Uh, without this normal means of community participation and for them social relationships has gone down. So it's important not only to look at the changes in, in, in means and these do vary across these domains, uh, but also to, to look at the fact that the standard deviations have been, have been going up. Um, so we can describe flourishing, uh, we can evaluate and track over time how it's, how it's changing. Um, uh, and and you know we can we can use it for purposes of self reflection, but can we improve it then? And that is of course a, a critical uh, a question. I won't be able to go into great uh, detail in, in this talk given our limited time, but I do want to spend some time on this important question, uh, both at the individual level and at the community level, and in thinking about the role of education. Um, I think one you know, important set of resources that has been developed over the last uh, few decades, which are relevant in school contexts, is a number of positive psychology interventions uh, and, and activities that can be uh, useful to try to promote uh, flourishing and, and practice. And a number of uh, these have been developed but that can easily be done uh, on one's own. I have a short review paper uh, sort of going through the, the, the evidence of different uh, activities um, many of which have been tested and examined in randomized trials that can be used to promote uh, various aspects of flourishing. Um, so for example, one of the most prominent ones are gratitude exercises, perhaps three times a week, write down three things that you're uh, thankful for and, uh, and, and why they came about. Do this for six weeks and it's been shown in randomized trials, even meta-analyses of, of randomized trials, that this has important effects on improving happiness and relieving um, depression and, and helping with sleep and self-reported health symptoms and, and, and so on and so forth. And likewise, uh, carrying out acts of, of kindness, um, maybe once a week, choose a single day and try to do five acts of kindness to someone that you wouldn't ordinarily otherwise uh, do. Or, or imagining one's best possible uh, self in, in the future and, and reflecting on that and writing about how um, one envisions that and how one might uh, attain uh, that or, or trying to use one's character strengths in, um, in new ways uh, each day. Um, and and these, these interventions or activities have been, have been proposed and I think well, well studied. And again, more details and evidence on this uh, is uh, available in, in this review paper, Activities for Flourishing, published in the Journal of Positive Psychology. Uh, and well-being, but activities like this uh, could be encouraged in school-based settings. One could even imagine sort of a gratitude campaign or an acts of kindness campaign. And again, evidence that these things would improve well-being. Um, likewise, various workbooks have been developed uh, to try to address various forms of psychological distress, including um, depression, anxiety, uh, anger, and, and, and forgiveness. Um, and these things aren't necessarily a substitute for you know, professional mental health care, uh, but can be helpful, I think, in addressing more, more mild symptoms. And these uh, resources could likewise, I think, be widely disseminated in, in school and in, in university context. I think these are important resources for education, to promote flourishing within education. And again, randomized trials have indicated pretty um, reasonable sized effects on um, happiness and life satisfaction and also various aspects of, of, of mental and, and perhaps even physical health. Interestingly, the effects of these do-it-yourself interventions on um, other aspects of flourishing like purpose or, or changing, improving character or social relationships are, are somewhat less clear. The positive psychology interventions that have been designed to, to change purpose have not been uh, as successful. And I think for these other domains of flourishing, we really need communities, we need longer term commitments and, and relationships. And so we need to think about flourishing not just at the individual level, but also at the institutional uh, level. And when I think about flourishing and trying to improve flourishing at the population level, um, I, I often try to use a public health lens. My own discipline is, is epidemiology, is, is, is public health. And when we think about the public health impact of an exposure or a phenomena or intervention, uh, we often look at it through the lens of two, two criteria. 
Um, first, how prevalent or common is the exposure or intervention or phenomena under study? Uh, and second, how large is, are its effects on the outcomes we care about? And if something is common and also has large effects on the outcomes that we care about, then it's going to shape population health. Um, so if we look at physical health examples of um, the major determinants of physical health using these two criteria are, are exercise or nutrition or not smoking or getting adequate sleep. But what would happen if we applied the same public health impact lens uh, to not just physical health, but the other domains of flourishing as well, happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, close social relationships. What shapes all of these things? What is common and has large effects, not just on physical health, but on each of these outcomes? We apply that lens to this list of flourishing domains, uh, we end up with a somewhat different list of uh, potential determinants. And so based on a review of the uh, prior literature on this topic, restricted to, to rigorous longitudinal studies over time and experimental and quasi-experimental designs, really trying to focus on the most rigorous studies, I would suggest four major pathways uh, that promote flourishing in each of these domains. And those four are family, work, education, and religious community. There's evidence that each of these is relatively common in the population, and in rigorous longitudinal studies, each has a relatively large effects across uh, the, the various flourishing domains. I don't think these four are necessarily uh, exhaustive, um, and, and they're, they're not, all four are not necessary. Um, one can flourish in the absence of, of one of these, but again, each of these does powerfully affect uh, flourishing, and I think if policy efforts were made to enhance the experience and, and improve life in each of these pathways, family, work, education, and religious community, uh, population level flourishing would, would improve considerably. Um, and so I want to focus briefly on um, education. Certainly um, some level of education is, is, is nearly universal, but of course the extent varies dramatically, and the quality varies dramatically uh, across contexts. And some of the earlier literature on, on happiness, say, and, and well-being had suggested relatively little association between educational attainment and happiness. But importantly, those studies were cross-sectional. They weren't the rigorous longitudinal studies that I'm talking about. And the problem with those cross-sectional studies is you really can't distinguish causal effects. You can't distinguish association and causation. And what was principally wrong with those studies is that they were controlling for the mechanisms by which education would lead to happiness and life satisfaction. They would adjust for, because they were cross-sectional, things like um, uh, employment or the likelihood of marriage or, or, or income. These were the primary pathways by which education would in fact shape happiness and life satisfaction. And once one uses more uh, rigorous longitudinal designs, you see that education really does affect happiness and life satisfaction as well. Uh, also uh, evidence for an effect of um, education on improved physical and, and mental health, uh, maybe stronger effects in the U.S. In, than in, in Europe uh, because of Europe's greater safety nets, but, but again, evidence for an effect on health as well. Um, evidence that education also leads to lower levels of crime, greater civic engagement. Um, effects on meaning and purpose are plausible, but there are in fact fewer rigorous studies on that, so more work to be done there. Uh, but evidence that uh, education also improves social relationships, leads to greater community involvement. Uh, typically delays marriage, but makes marriage more likely, uh, renders divorce less likely, so, so improves relationship quality. And of course, pretty substantial returns on education to, to, to income as well. So I think education really does powerfully shape um, these, uh, these various domains or aspects of flourishing. And, and um, more information on, um, on this literature review and um, summaries of, of prior evidence is, is available in that paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. But I do think education is one of the central pathways to promote flourishing uh, across these various domains. Um, and, and I think this work has, um, and, and the notion of flourishing, this flourishing lens has important uh, implications in thinking about how to um, enhance flourishing within school settings, within uh, education and how to use education itself to enhance flourishing. Um, so with regard to improving well-being within schools and, and universities, I think we really do need to start tracking uh, education um, 
uh, within education, we need to start tracking flourishing uh, over time. We should start measuring it routinely. Why aren't we doing this in uh, university uh, context? We really want to know whether things are improving or, or getting worse. And, and doing so can help us understand uh, which students may re require further, uh, further help. Um, so I, I think this is something that, that should be done uh, routinely and that we're trying to do here at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard. Um, I think the measurement also helps to ensure that well-being is part of the conversation. Well-being is part of what we're aiming for in, in education. It's, of course, not the only goal uh, of education. Uh, advancing knowledge and skills is, 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 is critical. Um, developing competencies, but well-being should be a part of what we are aiming for and really across these different domains of flourishing. And then finally, as I noted earlier, I think using the existing tools and activities and interventions uh, to try to, to promote well-being, uh, to promote gratitude and, and, and acts of kindness, to try to address questions of, of anger and, and, and forgiveness and, and, and depression, we should make use of these easy-to-use tools which are widely um, available and can be easily disseminated. I think these are different ways which we can improve uh, well-being or flourishing uh, within school and university contexts. Um, but as I noted earlier as well, I, I do think education itself uh, is an important pathway to, to subsequent flourishing. And, and because of that, I think it's important that all students have access to, to good schools, good teachers, um, that we invest heavily in education in our society. Um, accompanying that, I think there's also a need to, to, to have a mechanism by which to let uh, poorer, um, uh, not well-equipped teachers to, to, to go because it matters so much to students, having, having good teachers, that there needs to be such mechanisms in place as well. Um, you know, my own view would be that we should, we should probably disconnect uh, education funding from, from real estate taxes so that um, we don't have such a sharp gradient between um, you know, the, the, the neighborhood one lives in and the quality of education. I think uh, we, we could make efforts to try to pay teachers more who are working in disadvantaged neighborhoods to, to really try to improve education um, in, in all the different settings, since it is such an important pathway to subsequent uh, uh, flourishing. So I think there are different ways and policies by which some of these things could be brought about, but um, I, I do think we need to think critically about education as an important pathway to flourishing. Um, some of the work we're currently doing, kind of one of the open frontiers of our work at the Human Flourishing Program uh, at Harvard, is um, not just how do we improve individual well-being and flourishing in, in, in schools and educational settings and in other contexts, but how do we improve the community itself? How do we enhance uh, community well-being in schools? Um, and We've developed a, a basic measure of community well-being that can be used across contexts, but one of those contexts is uh, school-based settings. Uh, and, and this measure, um, still in kind of preliminary stages of, of data collection and, and validation, but you can find more information in this paper in the International Journal of Community Well-Being. Uh, but it tries to assess community well-being at the school level or in other community contexts across five domains, having good relationships within the community, having proficient leadership, having healthy practices within the community, the community itself being satisfying, and having a strong mission within the community. Um, and we've been collecting data in a variety of school settings, including a collaboration with the Shipley School and a number of others uh, underway. Um, and, and so we hope with this work, we will uh, likewise be able to track community well-being over time. And with further research, also understand the determinants of community well-being at the school level so that we can have both flourishing individuals and flourishing school communities as well. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you all uh, for listening, and I do hope that some of these ideas are helpful in the promotion of flourishing, individual flourishing, and flourishing in educational communities more broadly. Thank you.